I want to tell you a little bit about some of the excitement that's come from merging fields, from reaching across the farthest stretches, the boundaries that are, seem most separate, and the advances that can come from that. It's, a, it's an exciting time. What we've been able to do is take genes from microbes, single-celled organisms like those you see on the left here, and apply them to understand how the mammalian and human brains work uh, at, at the most high-level cognitive tasks and the deepest emotions. It's a, a fascinating story. It's also one that matters very much to me uh, and I think to, to everybody here in this room. Uh, this painting uh, on the left for me captures the isolation of uh, depression and of, of uh, more broadly of, of psychiatric disorders. The difficulty of just understanding compounds the suffering that comes from these disorders. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we at least could look at the brain and read it like a book to understand what was going on and what was different at a physical level. And now, with these proteins and these genes for microbes, we actually are reaching this physical level of understanding of our emotions. And to get to that point, we actually started, in some ways, billions of years ago. Uh, the most basic tasks of life on Earth, to create energy from the environment and we all are familiar with chlorophylls. This was one of the, and currently the dominant way of harvesting energy from light on Earth. But there's a more ancient system, a much simpler one. Uh, retinoids are vitamin A-like molecules, as you can see, much smaller and simpler. And the ancient oceans were filled with microorganisms that made green light activated pumps that moved ions, charged particles, across the membrane of the cell in response to a photon of light and they used this retinoid, this vitamin A-like molecule, to receive the photon. These were mostly green light activated, and that central curve there you can see captures the visible spectrum, the wavelengths of light that we can see between about 480 and 600 nanometers. This was such a dominant paradigm that there wasn't much light in that spectrum for the chlorophylls to use, and that's why a lot of them are those waves on the left and the right, using the non-visible spectrum, everything but green, and this is why plants are green today. They were forced to use everything but green to generate light. This was such a dominant paradigm. These organisms are still around. Uh, they make these green light activated pumps. And some examples of those are shown in the upper left. These are single celled algae uh, that have flagella that swim around and have to find the right level of light to do photosynthesis. And what we did here at Stanford, beginning just over 20 years ago, we figured out how to get the genes for these light receptors and to put them into neurons, into particular types of brain cells. And now all neurons are electrical. If you just put an electrode in the brain, you're going to stimulate all the cells that are there. But if you can gen use genetic tricks and put in a gene that encodes a light receptor, none of the cells normally respond to light, then you've got some leverage. And you can then use light to turn on or off that group of cells, because the movement of charged particles across the membrane, just like those ancient organisms did, this is how neurons work. They move electric current across their membrane. So that was the insight and that was the opportunity. This was done just over 20 years ago. What I did was uh, take one of these genes, and this is the notebook page from my first experiment, uh, July 1st, 2004, and I put this gene into neurons and I found I could activate neurons with light. And this has created a whole host of opportunities. I'll show you uh, first. We just want to understand these proteins much better. There's a huge family of them. It's not just the green light activated ones. We've been able to find and discover a vast family. They respond to red light. They can move positive ions. They can move negative ions. And myself and my colleagues, we've been able to identify them. And then we've used molecular tools. By the way, they're beautiful organisms. They're single cells. They are very efficient. And that's one of the reasons we like using these, is because they encompass all the action of receiving light and generating that electric current all in a single gene, a single protein. If you're a single-celled organism, you've got to be pretty efficient. You don't have a lot of space to, to waste. And that makes these great as, as, as tools for us to use. Uh, we've been able to get the high-resolution structures of these beautiful proteins using the same technology, X-ray crystallography, that was used to resolve the double helical structure of DNA. And getting that structure has allowed, allowed us to see the exact atomic level positioning of how they do this beautiful task of turning light into electricity. And then we can go in and change that. And we've been able to turn up their properties, shift the color of light they respond to, change the, 
kind of ions that cross the membrane and getting these high resolution structures and understanding the exact positioning of atoms has let us do that. At the same time, we can now go all the way to the level of the behaving mammal carrying out complex tasks and see now which neurons, which cells cause, actually make particular things happen. And we can go all the way from simple movements to complex priority shifting, the resolution of primal drives. I'll show you a couple examples in movie form. Here was actually the first experiment we did that revealed to us that we could make this work in mammals. We took a mouse, and many of you know the right side of the brain will control movement toward and attention to the left side of the world. So we took a fiber optic and we put in a little uh, spot of light into the right part of the brain, and this was a mouse that had one of these opsins. It's written there as CHR2, that stands for channel rhodopsin 2, which is one of these microbial proteins. So we'll play this movie and you'll see the mouse is just sitting there, not doing anything, and then you'll see a little spot of blue light uh, on the right side of its head. That's where the light goes in and you'll see if the animal does anything that's leftward oriented. So here is the mouse, not doing much. <laughs> then we turn off the light. Looks up at us, what, it, what happened there? <laughs> As you can imagine, incredibly exciting for us, also a little disturbing, right? A little chilling, right? <laughs> and if you had any doubt that our actions are due to the activity, electrical activity of a few cells in the brain, uh, you, that, that debate is, is over. And it's not just movement, it's complex actions. Here's a somewhat more complex action, resolution of primary drives. A lot of things we do to survive, uh, to reproduce. Here's a mouse that's fully sated, has had plenty of food and water, but we've identified neurons that, that control thirst, the fundamental survival drive. And so before we turn on the light here, the animal's aware of the resources and environment, doesn't care much about it. Fully sated animal, not thirsty. And then we drive the thirst neurons and you'll see what happens to this uh, not thirsty animal. So it explores the environment, not interested. Then we start driving the thirst neurons here. Goes right to the, the water, starts drinking. So again, if you had any doubt that our drives, our decisions are controlled by the electrical events in a few cells, uh, well, this, this uh, hopefully should clarify things. And this has, very important implications, knowing the cells that actually matter for normal health, for adaptive behaviors, very interesting, basic science, basic biology, and by getting the structures of these ancient proteins and modifying them to be better and better in this sort of task, we can do this sort of work much more effectively. But it also helps us understand how things go wrong in disease. The primary decisions that are made, energy, motivation, think about eating disorders. We now have insights into uh, psychiatry and even ideas uh, for treatment now. I'll give you an example that just came out this year from our lab. We've all, you were just taken on a roller coaster of emotions uh, right before I came out here. <laughs> we all felt emotions uh, that are manifested in our body. We all are aware of this, and these are very, very challenging times. I'm sure all of us have felt in our body very, very severe expression of emotions. And people have thought about this for a long time. Why do we feel things in our body, in our heart, in our gut? And the psychologist, William James, speculated that our sensations in our body, in a fundamental sense, are the emotion. Of course, the brain's important to detect and understand what's going on, but the actual emotion is what's felt in the body. And he said, well, if you took away the pounding of the heart, would that really be anxiety or fear that was left? A very interesting question, but very hard to test because there was never a way to specifically cause those changes in the body. You couldn't just turn up heart rate. You can do that with a drug, but the drug would act on many things. It would act on neurons, it would act on the brain, it would act on other cells in the body. But optogenetics, which is the technology that we developed here at Stanford, this is what we call using these microbial proteins and activating them with light. Optogenetics gives us the opportunity to do this because what we can do is put some of these ancient microbial proteins together with our wonderful team into the heart and this is an image of the heart where we put one of these ancient proteins into the muscle wall of the heart. And now we can pace the heart specifically and directly at any speed we want. And we can ask, does this matter for the emotional or affective 
as we say, state of the animal. So we outfitted a nice LED vest, a very fashionable uh, uh, light source. And it, the mice can move freely. They're very comfortable. Uh, uh, we've made very sensitive, very light sensitive opsins now. So we don't even have to use fiber optics. We can just have a wearable uh, with, with LEDs. And we can pace the heart at any rate we want. The resting mouse heart rate is at 600 beats per minute. We can make it 700, 800, 900, 1,000. Get to the levels uh, that are, correspond to anxiety. And the first question we can ask is, does it matter to the animal? And we could do a simple test in a neutral environment. It turned out it didn't matter. We had a two chambers. The animal could be in the left one or the right one. And we only drove the heart faster on the right one. And we could see where the animal chose to spend its time. Spend its time equally. It didn't care that its heart was pounding faster in one chamber than the other. OK, so in a neutral setting, it didn't matter to the animal that the heart was going faster. But if we put it in a anxiogenic environment, as we say, an anxiety-provoking environment. If you're a mouse, you don't like to be exposed. You don't like to be out in the open. And we have this very simple test. There's, we call this the elevated plus maze. There's the closed arms that the animal prefers to spend its time in. It feels secure there, much preferable to the open arms, which are the vertical ones here, where they're out and exposed uh, to predators. And they normally much prefer to spend their time in the closed arm. If we pace the heart faster, that preference was even further exacerbated. They very, very uh, uh, powerfully avoided the exposed arm. So the brain, of course, still important to detect the threat, but the body, what's actually happening in the body matters. It matters causally for the expression of emotion. And this sort of insight, I think we can all think about how we maybe counsel our friends or our children uh, in, in times of stress. We uh, talk about, and we use this as structured therapies as well, how to modulate breathing, how to modulate thinking. Uh, this, now we know the bodily changes are directly and provably causal, and we can quantify this using these ancient microbial tools, and gives us opportunities to under understand ourselves uh, as well as uh, potential new therapies. And to be able to reach back into an ancient question almost 150 years ago with these uh, microbial proteins is a, for something for me as a psychiatrist, as well as a neuroscientist, and a biochemist, something that is, is very rewarding. Now, I've talked about anxiety. Psychiatry is, has many domains of, of disorder uh, that many of us are familiar with. Uh, if any of you are curious about this, I've, I've written a book uh, called Projections. It came out uh, a year or so ago where I go through major classes of psychiatric disorders in each of the different chapters. I start with my clinical uh, experience. I tell stories of patients that I've encountered here at Stanford in the emergency room, and I take the opportunity to try to express those feelings in, in words. In the, in the schizophrenia chapter, I allow the writing to be fragmented in ways that I've heard my patients use. In the mania chapter, I allow the, the words to be exuberant and try to capture that overabundance of emotion uh, that we see in, in mania. But at the same time, I also try to, try to draw the connections with the insights that have come from optogenetics uh, for neuroscience. And so and if, you, if you have friends or colleagues who are interested in where science has brought us and how, how far and how fast it's come in just the last 20 years, uh, uh, you may wish to, to take a look. And I hope, I hope that understanding at least is something that we can change now. And there's hope for the future that the technology developed right here at Stanford has brought us. Amazing that these ancient microbial tools have brought us here. I want to thank you for being here as well, for sharing this moment with us. And I want to thank the amazing community that we have here at Stanford. So uh, welcome home.